just <coughs> as he walked. And that probably goes to all of your experiences about learning about Jesus. Like, wow, that <coughs> seems hard. It really seems hard. But the love thing, I know what it's like to be loved by the Lord and want to give it away. That seems natural. Jesus had some things to say about following him, and it reminded me of a road. And we went on lots of road trips with Uncle Pop, and uh, I've got to be in 49 states, not in Hawaii yet, uh, but I've been a lot of places thanks to all the road trips with Mom and Dad. And so I started thinking about this concept of traveling with Jesus, following Jesus in a, in a road kind of story. My mind works best in pictures. Now, when we packed up on the road, Dad would always make sure we had a toolbox in the back of the suburban or the station wagon. Uh, and often I saw uh, we would pull off the side of the road, Dad would help people. We'd pack up everything. I, I visibly remember the uh, Rand McNally Atlas. Mom was co-pilot. She would tell Dad where to go and when he was to turn. So this road trip in town, I started thinking about Jesus. What did Jesus have to say about following the road and getting to him? Was it the wide road or the narrow road? The narrow, narrow road. road. And how many find it? Few. A few. A few. Narrow road, few find it. There was a moment on all of our trips uh, that I loved when we get to go to the gas station and get food. And uh, junk food in our house was rare. Being able to fly, it was a luxury. So going on road trips and getting the snacks was my favorite. So to get this road trip, Jesus said, the road is narrow, if you find it. And then the food. And it took me back to a moment when the disciples were talking to each other and like, hey, Jesus, he hasn't ate anything. Jesus, do you have any food? And he said, I have food that you don't know anything about, that you don't see. The food that he, that was supplied him, is doing the will of his father. So on this road trip, what would nourish us is doing the will of our father. And also on those road trips with mom and pop, um, being a suburban or station wagon, uh, we would lay down the back seats and sleeping bags and you know, we would just all camp out in the back going down the road. And so on our travel now we're thinking about where do we, what would sleep be like traveling with Jesus. And Jesus mentioned that foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man doesn't even have a place to rest his head. So the sleep on this journey um, also seems hard. And Jesus talked about the danger. He said, I'm sending you out as sheep among the wolves. Traveling again, getting to your destination, finally arriving, that reward. Traveling with Jesus, what's that reward? He talked about a pearl of great price. One that if you discovered it, you would sell everything to go purchase it because you knew its value. He also shared that his kingdom was like a buried treasure in a piece of land. That you knew where it was, you knew that treasure was in that land, you went and bought that land. So you can have the treasure. What Jesus has to offer is a great reward, and it's worth everything. Now, traveling again with five, uh, well, all of us, I'm one of five siblings, um, there can be some attitudes, and I may have picked a few moments where I deserved getting some noogies and some, some harassment, um, but most of them had to be my siblings causing it. But our attitudes on the journeys are not always the best. And I'm thinking about Jesus, and he had some things to say about our attitudes while traveling on this journey following him. There was a fellow that was known to be wealthy, and he was talking to Jesus about all the things he'd, he'd accomplished. And by rights, pretty good man. Followed the law, was obedient. I'm sure he was a kind person. 
And he said, Jesus, what else, what else is there? I've done all these things. Jesus says, one more thing. Sell all of your possessions, give them to the poor, and follow me. That was heavy because the fellow was going to be rich, and he wasn't willing to give it up, and he walked away. Jesus also reminded us to pick up our cross and follow him. Jesus said some really harsh things that are hard to wrap our brains around. So to follow him, we must even hate our family and follow him. And compared to the love that we have to our family, the love we should have for our Lord Jesus should almost be as if we're neglecting our own family because of the deep love we have for him. But to hear those words, you must hate your family. Jesus also talked about not looking back. He said, if a man put his hand to the plow and looked back, he's not fit for the kingdom. It's hard. Jesus had a lot of hard statements about following him. How could we possibly make this? Well, Matthew chapter 19, 26, around the story of the rich young ruler that could not give away his wealth. His disciples talking to him about, Lord, this is, this is tough. And Jesus said, yes, with man, it's impossible. But with God, nothing is impossible. I repeat that. With God, nothing is impossible. This journey that seems so hard for us it is hard. You keep your eyes on Jesus, it's possible. <coughs> Our mission on this journey, tell the good news. The gospel message, Matthew chapter 28, the famous commission to go out into all nations. To preach the gospel, the good news, make disciples. He encouraged us to have the faith of the apostles, challenged his apostles and I choose to believe he's talking to me too. I choose to believe he's talking to all of us when he commands his apostles to go out and do what he did. Heal the sick. Take care of the need to show the love that we've been given, given to others. Do we dare even think that God even calls us to raise a person who has passed away? Could God even use us to help someone receive their eyesight back? Yes. Could God even use us in this room to go pray for a person and we would see them walk again? Yes. Why not? God has not changed. The mission has not changed. Our Lord Jesus hasn't changed. And Holy Spirit hasn't changed. And the needs haven't changed. Is this impossible? For us, impossible. For God, nothing is impossible. Now what I've covered so far in our little chat, for most of us, is nothing new. You know, almost 3,000 years of knowing Jesus, that's stuff you've heard, right? But how are we doing on this journey? How am I doing on this journey with Jesus? How are you doing on this journey with Jesus? Have you gone as far as you can go? <coughs> are you comfortable? We first started talking about following sports. Think of a sports fan. Some sports fans will shift teams, or some sports fans will stay a fan as long as it's comfortable for them. As long as their team's winning, as long as they have buddies they can pile around with. They're okay with being a fan. That's about as far as they'll go. Some fans will buy season tickets. That's, that's a financial commitment. Some fans will make sure that they watch every time it's on the station. Some fans will wear their jerseys to the workplace the next day. 
So kind of in your mind what a fan might be. And we talked a little about following Jesus. And Jesus, his version is hard. Right? It's hard. He wants, he wants you to be sold out. So we have a fan, follower. What I'd like for us all to consider is what is it like to be fallen? Fallen in love. Fan, follower, fallen in love. Thinking about following Jesus makes sense just to see how Jesus followed. Who did Jesus follow? Followed his daddy. Referred to him as Abba. He taught us that name, that dear tender name of Abba. What did it look like for Jesus to follow his Abba? <coughs> Prayer was really important to him. He'd rather pray than eat, for sure. And he spent quality time with his daddy. He got away from the, the band of knuckleheads that he took care of. He got away from them and he prayed. He took time to fast. There is a moment that is, is makes your head scratch. There's a moment where a child was demon possessed and his disciples, I'm sure calling out the name of Jesus because they knew what he could do, could not cast the demon out of the child. And when Jesus came back and saw what happened and the demon knew Jesus was coming close and Jesus just had to make a simple kind of go. The demon left and the disciples were like, what's difficult? Can we do that, Jesus? He said, this only comes out through fasting and prayer. Jesus knew the importance of fasting. Jesus was 110% obedient. It was his joy to be obedient to his daddy. A beautiful psalm, chapter 45, verse 7, speaks of this Obedience and the blessing of it. <coughs> you love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. Just let that soak in a minute. Speaking of Jesus, you love righteousness. Because he knows it pleases his daddy. He hates wickedness because he knows it hurts his daddy's heart to see his children hurting. And his daddy said him above all of his companions and anointed him with a flow of joy. Jesus probably had this joy that was like nothing people have ever seen. <coughs> we have the Father's oil of joy. <coughs> what can this look like for us? <coughs> I am blessed to have had a good dad who would tell you he learned to be a good dad by being the opposite of his own dad. Right? <laughs> yeah. I've heard my dad say, Praise God for my dad because he told me how not to live. And I had a wonderful daddy. Still do, still have a wonderful daddy. What you think about what it's like if you if you think of a little boy and his daddy. And I'm blessed, my wife and I are blessed to have a now 16-year-old boy, sophomore in high school, plays football for Seymour. <coughs> Sophomore and plays varsity, and God has shown me favor on the field. He, I get to hear his name called by the announcer. Plays linebacker, and I'm very proud of our boy. He's very quiet, um, very unassuming, and a handsome fellow thanks to his mom's genetics. Um, no offense, only family, but I married well. I have such love for our son. 
I don't have time to tell you everything, but I can tell you our first daughter, Victoria, is 24. If it was not for the hand of God, she would have died through strangulation of the umbilical cord. God spared her. She has a beautiful voice. I find that ironic that the cord almost took her life, uh, those vocal cords. Um, she's a gold medalist vocalist. Our next daughter, Liberty, um, she spent 31 days in intensive care, another story of God's mercy and healing. And this church family prayed mightily for her. She's 21 and studying um, ministry, and uh, she's full of life and vigor. And our son, William, spent 40 days in intensive care um, for a different event. And without the hand of God, all three children would not be here, and I would not be a dad standing before you. Not the way I am now. And there was a moment, and one morning, I was praying uh, by a little love seat on the couch, and knelt down, and I prayed, and I just uh, was talking to God and just praying, and a little pitter-patter of feet came up, and it was William as a toddler, and he came and said, what you doing? Come up your son, I'm praying. And he curled, he was small enough to curl up. And so I just got to curl up and now my eyes were not dry. I was just weeping and thinking that this miracle boy was in my arms and I was struck with awe. Oh, Father, how could Abraham have done such a thing? How could he take his boy up a mountain? Going up the mountain, he knew that he was taking his boy and handing him over to God hopeful all along, but he was still trusting in God of the hill. And then I was overwhelmed with, oh, Father, what you have done with your own son for me. It was an overwhelming moment. Being able to experience that as a dad of, of all of that kind of brings me back to this relationship with Abba. Our Heavenly Father, thanks to Jesus, who makes it possible. So things that we can consider is, what is keeping us from this tenderness, this closeness, from knowing the creator of the universe as our Abba, our Daddy? What gets in the way? What gets in the way of our neighbors and our family and our friends our co-workers, what gets in the way of them knowing that the creator of the universe, albeit we should have holy reverence for, can be known as Abba. What I've learned in my own life, distractions. Just distractions of all sorts. Being a dad, having a crazy dachshund in the house, <laughs> that crazy dog, Side note, it wakes me up like between 4.30 and 5 every day. And so rather than be mad at the dog anymore, that's when my Bible study time starts. <laughs> so I'm no longer mad at the dog. I think that's my new alarm clock. It's waking up that crazy thing. But distractions will keep us from Abba. Pride? Oh, yeah. Unforgiveness? This is what I think a lot of people may think they're okay with. But when you rewrite it as the word of being offended, it's huge. And we just think about distractions, pride, and being offended. That will steal your time away and knowing God is Baba. What it might look like, distractions, my phone, which I purposely try to stay away from it because there's so much on there that it's it's hard to get just what you want, right? Yes, there's family and friends on Facebook. There's discussion groups, and I learn a lot of stuff. There's so much garbage, and it's hard to not do one more click, one more scroll. I work with young people. I see what technology has connected them with, and scientifically, it does affect your brain. And so just having access to the internet in your pocket and convenient in your hand is a huge distraction. And you will have to put that away if you want quality time with Abba. Yes, there's good Bible studies on there. I use it. I use my phone to compile my notes and everything for tonight. It's a good tool. But 
but you have to know how to put it away so that you have quiet time with Abba. What would pride look like? Pride might say something like, I'm good, I'm good. I'm sure there was a time, Dad, when you were showing me something as a young man, and I probably said, I got it, Dad, I got it, I got it. <laughs> Happens with every son and dad. I got it, let me just let me try, I got it. Friends, I'm pretty sure we do that with our Heavenly Father. I got it, God, give me a chance, I got it. Let me do this, let me show you what I can do. Mm. Scary territory. There may be some pride in a church service from time to time. Um, judgmental, we, we struggle sometimes. Oh, Lights on. <laughs> hey, <what's going> on? <laughs> Not a coincidence, because I just talked about pride in a church service. That can be rampant. That was quite okay with all of us going to church. He's super cool with that, right? It gets a little uneasy when we start wanting to come close to Heavenly Father, when we want to start opening up and confessing, or we want to get out of our church pews and be active in the church family. That's when he gets fussy. The devil's quite okay with all of us going to church. He really doesn't care. When you start taking it serious, when you start wanting to get involved, that's when he gets fussy. So yeah, there's, there's pride that can happen even in a church service. Being offended, unforgiveness, that also is a problem. Being offended at something probably going to teeter you more on arrogance, and pride versus humility. Pretty sure of that. It's pretty hard for a humble person to be offended at others. So some steps to get closer to God. Ask Holy Spirit to search your hearts. It's his purpose. David cried out, search me, O God. Search my heart, my anxious thoughts. See if there's anything, anything, any book in there. He didn't use the word book. Anything in there, God, that's offensive to you, show it to me. Ask Holy Spirit to look into your heart. Put yourself aside yourself aside. They can come a lot of different ways, but put yourself aside and sing to Him. And one of the reasons why starting here tonight was so special to me was a moment that happened about right there in the middle. A gentleman with a black hat in our dream. There you go. Right about there, I was in college, and I was in that row with my, I was um, dating my wife at the time. And we were standing there, and the songs that were being played had the word Father in them. We sang, sang like three or four songs, and every time I heard the word Father, the water works just kept coming. Like, what is wrong with me? Why am I crying? I'm a college student. I, these songs have never made me cry before. What is going on? I couldn't figure it out. I started thinking back, like, oh, oh, when is the last time? I told my dad I loved him. I couldn't think of a time. Matter of fact, I tried hard to be tough. Being the youngest of five kids and having a bigger brother, trying to want to be big like him, I thought I had to be tough. I looked at neighborhood kids, guys on the football team, trying to be tough, and tough guys don't do that sort of thing. It hit me right there in college. I don't remember the last time I told my dad I loved him. And it really started flowing. After church service, Dad was in the back corner of the room at an elders meeting, like that way. And I went there and I said, Dad, can I talk to you? Sure, son. I want to tell you I love you. And uh, I'm sure Dad had no idea what was going on in me, but he graciously received the words. And there was something in me that felt more freer, uh, more barriers down, and I, I felt a little more. I thought that was all part of the journey until one day, Serving in a church on the other side of Columbus, Garden City, sitting on the front row, and um, I was up there, and we were singing, and then I understood what that moment was about. 
absolutely I needed to tell Pop I loved him. And I wasn't all that was about. Because it goes back to my early church experience in the Taylorsville Methodist Church. My dad would stand right over here with a hymnal, and he would tell you what page to turn to. Um, he had your job at the Methodist Church. And I loved singing. Mom tells a story that I would say, hey, Daddy, hey, Daddy, until he acknowledged me as a little boy. When I first started to read, reading the hymnal was awesome. There's something about music that just moved in me. One day, as a little boy, I noticed a chuckling, and behind me were two older gals, and they were snickering at me. Now, I know that they thought it was just cute, right? But as a toddler, as a little boy, as a little elementary boy, I was embarrassed. And from that young boy, it's probably, it was early, early grade school. Until that moment, I never sang at church. I don't want to be embarrassed. That day that I started crying over the word Father, I started singing to God. I moved forward a number of years later, much older, I think we at least had two of our children at the time. I made Garden City, sitting on the front row, and it hits me. Oh my goodness, that wasn't just about my earthly dad. That was so much more about my heavenly dad. For I finally understood that singing to the Lord is how one way, one great way, we can say that we love him. All those years, from a little boy to a college young man, I had neglected to tell Abba I loved him in song. Just from that day forward, I love singing because it's not for anybody in the room. It's for one. I love singing to Abba. And if there's something in you that would cause you not want to sing, which I don't think it's this room because you're all singing beautifully and, and it was wonderful. But if, if you're one that thinks, oh, I'm not a singer, or you might make a joke about, you don't want to hear my voice. I can tell you the person, the one who wants to hear your voice, who deserves to hear your voice, that is your Abba, your Heavenly Father. Jesus, oh, Psalm 7, you right back to a kid. He deserves, he's worthy of all that we have. He's worthy of singing to. It doesn't matter what people think about your voice. It really doesn't. It matters what your heart is doing and, and, and singing to what is worthy. The last two things I want to encourage you with. Spend time with Abba in prayer and in his word. I was encouraged like this one time. As a dad, to have a young one sit beside you and not ask for money, not tattle on a sibling, not want to be fed, they just want to sit beside you. It feels awesome. When you're praying, if you just want to hear him, your Abba, if you just want to tell him your day, and you're not complaining about your neighbor or your family, you're not worried about a bill being paid, you're not asking for anything, you're just wanting to spend time with him and ask him, like, how do you do it, Lord? I would imagine it makes me feel pretty good. It makes me feel good. And what about reading the Word of God? What if when you spend time reading the Word of God, it's just to get to know Him? My Bible time changed when I decided I have no agenda anymore. Except one. I just want to discover more about it. I used to read the Bible just for my Bible study lessons or Sunday school lessons. I'd have to get some content to give it out. Right? Not anymore. When I have my study time in the morning after that crazy dachshund wakes me up to take care of her, I sit down, I just open it up to wherever it may happen, and I just, I just want to discover him. It's really changed my relationship with Father God. So much so that I'll, I'll share this one little moment with you. In the mornings, I try to make a point to talk to God before I get out of bed. Before my feet hit the ground, I sit up 
and I thank Him for a new day. I ask Him to be with me and, and help me in simple prayers, like, good morning, God. There was a day that something came out of my mouth I wasn't expecting. It shocked me when I said it. I said, God, I want to be part of your day today. I want to be with you. And I stopped and I thought, why have I never said that before? <laughs> and so I started praying every morning. God, I want to be part of your day. I want to hang out with you. And there was a moment where um, I was I was invited to participate at jail ministry, and I was asked to give a talk. And preparing for a talk of that magnitude is a really big deal because the people uh, that you get to talk to, they may not hear that kind of encouragement for a long time. And the folks that get to participate in jail ministry, they take it very serious. I struggled so mightily trying to figure out what to say for this event that when we had our practice night, it was my time to give my, my practice, my talk. I'm like, Bill, I, I got nothing. I have tried. I've stayed up late hours. I can't get my brain right. Brother, I think I only have an intro. And he was so kind. Oh, I had a Bible verse. He's so kind. He goes, Brother, share what you got. Now, the minimum was 15 minutes. You had to at least have a 15-minute talk. And I just trusted the Lord and shared. And I got done with 16 minutes. Like, well, it was still a struggle. So, moments before I gave the talk on a Saturday, I had some quiet time, and I said, Lord, I don't understand. Why was it so hard for me to get this together? I tried weeks in advance. Why? Why? And very sweetly, very softly, and I knew it was his voice, he said, I just wanted to spend time with you. I knew exactly what he meant because I struggled with procrastination. And if he gave me that talk two weeks earlier, I'd have wrote it, I'd put it in a binder, and I wouldn't pull it out till Friday night. He knows me. But man, that was so tender for him to do that. He caused me to be in his word. So much so that it drew me closer. One more moment of being with Dad. I got to give another talk at another event. And in between time, in prayer, another thing slipped out I wasn't expecting. And I was saying, Lord, I'm going to be part of your day today. When I said that, I immediately saw the passenger seat of Dad's old work van. Pop used to be in maintenance for many years, and he had a brown van for a while, or a white van. And I, when I said, God, I want to be with you today, I saw the passenger seat of that work van, and I immediately was fluttered with the joy of riding around with my dad and carrying tools with him. I love those precious moments. And I said, God, can I ride around in your work van today? Can I ride around with you today? I want to see you work. And I had the most amazing God stories in those days following. Wonderful kingdom encounters. Then the jail ministry moment happened, and I said, Lord, before my talk, I said, Lord, do you have anything for me this time? It was so sweet the last time. Do you have anything to have for me? And very sweetly, very softly, I heard, I just wanted you to ride around with me. And the reason that was special is because in that event, I got to help lead, and I felt like I did nothing. The team worked so well, I felt guilty like I didn't provide anything. I, God just did it all, and I was struggling a little bit, but like, God, did you really even, was I doing what I was supposed to be doing? And at that moment, he said, I just wanted you to ride around with me. So tender, so sweet, and so uniquely. And I guarantee you, he's talking to each of you uniquely as well. Nearly 3,000 years of God's stories and kingdom encounters. It's not over, friends. It's not over more opportunities to hang out with Abba, ride around with him, see how he loves on people and encourages people. This is the God that we serve. Now it seems proper if we have an opportunity um, as we close. If our good friend in a moment would play for us more time, I've decided to follow Jesus. I could have the words.
And if you would like to come up here to pray in the fashion that you would like and just say, Daddy, I missed you. Abba, I love you. Daddy, I want to ride around in your work truck tomorrow. If you are ready and willing and interested and desire that kind of love, come forward. If you are already deeply in love with Jesus, there's going to be somebody standing beside you that doesn't know him as lovely as you do. And you can put your arm around him and you can pray for him. Pray with him. But we're singing this song, I want to encourage you, come forward to the altar. At least know how you love him.